All right, section 5.7 is going to pretty much just take the previous sections and extend on them a little bit. So I'm gonna just kind of briefly introduce the stuff that might be somewhat new compared to the last few sections that you've been doing. And the first thing you have to remind yourself, which actually is not new, but what is a conjugate? So we talked about what a conjugate was back in chapter four. So what is a conjugate? Um, it is if you have any binomial piece. So for example, if you had two plus three X, it's conjugate would be 2 minus 3x. So basically, if you have a binomial piece, you know, two pieces, you just switch the sign of the part with the variable. So if it's plus 3x, you change it to minus 2x. So how about if it's a complex conjugate? Now this we covered in chapter four, so you should be familiar with this. So it's conjugate to 2 plus 3i would be 2 minus 3i. And again, you only change the imaginary part um, and not the positive two stays positive two. Um, irrational conjugate, now this will be new to this section, if you have a radical, which of course is irrational, as long as it's not a perfect square, you just change the sign of the um, irrational number. So instead of 3 minus the square root of 2, you would do 3 plus the square root of 2. So those are conjugates, nothing tricky. All right, a couple concepts you're going to want to think about before you watch the 5.7 videos is if I have a fifth degree function, how many zeros do I have? Now this I've been covering several and several times actually in the in the last few videos. So if you have a fifth degree function, any degree function, you have that many zeros. So if I have a fifth degree function, I'm going to have five zeros. Okay, if I have a fifth degree function and three of the zeros are real, what do I know about the other two? Okay, so I know that three of them are real, so that means it's going to cross the x-axis three times. Um, but it's a fifth degree function, so what do I know about the other two? They have to be imaginary. Now I want you to think about any odd degree function looks something like this, right? The curvature in the middle might be not as drastic, but for sure the m behavior will always look like that for any odd degree function. So if it crosses three times, something like this, that means you have to have two imaginary. If it would only cross once, like if it just came up and went like this and only crossed once, then the other four solutions would be imaginary. Um, so is it possible to have an odd amount of irrational or imaginary zeros? Like could I have this crossing four times, which means my, I would only have one imaginary? And that's impossible. If you think about it just visually speaking, it's not going to happen. But if you also think about the quadratic formula, you know, where you do the opposite of b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, if your discriminant, which is this part, right, is negative, you're going to have an imaginary solution. Well, there's always a plus or minus in front of that. Hence, Imaginary solutions always come in pairs. So if this were negative 3 plus 2i, you're also going to have negative 3 minus 2i. So is it possible to have an odd amount of imaginary zeros? Absolutely not. Okay, so if I have um, two imaginary solutions or irrational, um, I could have four, I could have six, but I could never have an odd amount. Okay, another question that's going to come in handy in this section is how do you write a function in standard form if you only know the solutions? Okay, so let me give you a little more information. Let's say that I told you that you're going to have a cubic function. Okay, and you only know the solutions. So I told you that the solutions or the zeros or the roots, right, all the same thing, um, are 1, 3, and negative 7. Okay, so you have all three of those solutions are real, and you know you have a cubic function. How do you put that function in standard form? Well, I know if I have a solution that crosses at 1 on the x-axis, its factor would have to be x minus 1. And remind yourself why this works. If you take this factor and set it equal to 0, 
you're going to get positive 1 as a solution. So if it crosses at positive 3, its factor will be x minus 3. If it crosses at negative 7, its factor will be x plus 7. Now, if you think about it, if I'm multiplying all of these together, um, and I want it in standard form, so that means I would just have to multiply all of these out, which I won't do because we're going to do this in another video, but I would FOIL these two out and then take that trinomial times the last x plus 7, and then I would have my cubic function in standard form. So very simple concept. I just want you to understand that connection between a 0 and its factor. So basically whatever the solution is, you negate it as a factor. So x minus 1, x minus 3, x plus 7. Piece of cake. Okay, last concept that's important. If f of x equals 2x cubed plus 3x minus 10x, what does f of 0 equals 0 mean to you? Well, that means if I put in 0 for x, that f of x, or y, right, should equal 0. That's all that says. So that also tells me that 0 is a solution. And how do I know that that means 0 is a solution? Well, if I do f of anything and get 0, that means it doesn't have a remainder, hence that is a solution. And of course, you can always check yourself if you put in 0 here. And this will be real easy to check, um, except for I'm going to run out of room here. Well, all of those are going to be 0, right? So f of 0, sure enough, equals 0. So again, if you know that f of something, anything, equals 0, that means that that number, that x value, is a solution.